This is Value Investing. I'm your host, Jun Kim. In this podcast, you'll learn everything related to value investing. Welcome to episode 4 of Value Investing. This week, we'll talk about two interesting topics. First, we are going to talk about the ground rules that Warren Buffett set for his investment partnership. This is particularly important because this is the tool that Warren Buffett used in order to communicate effectively, efficiently, and clearly with his limited partners and investors. And second, we're going to go into the area of merger arbitrage situation. And this is going to be very interesting, I promise to you, because Warren Buffett never talked about these things openly in the public. And in his early investment career, he did a lot of deals related to merger arbitrage situations. So I think it's going to be interesting if you're interested in this space. So why don't we get started? First, let's talk about the ground rules that Warren Buffett set out for his investment partnership operation. And you can find these ground rules, the details in 1963 investment partnership letter that Warren Buffett sent out to his limited partners. The first ground rule is that he's not going to guarantee any rate of return to his investors. This is quite obvious. One thing that I want to add here is that if you find anyone or any investment advisor who claims that he or she can guarantee above 15%, then that's a completely fraud. I think that I've heard a lot of commercials or advertisements claiming that they can guarantee 25% return. I don't think you can find that type of guarantee anywhere. That's something that I think you should be aware of if you are investing your money because above 15% return sounds too good to be true. Second, Warren Buffett mentioned that his performance has to be always measured against the benchmark Dow. And this is the point that I discussed in the last episode as well. But it's important to understand how he measures his performance. Because when you see Dow going down, let's say, 25%, negative 25%, if his investment performance is negative 10%, which is 15 points above the Dow's performance, then he considered this performance as satisfactory. Whereas his investment, let's say, goes up by 20%, if Dow at the same time went up by 25%, then he doesn't think that this is a good investment performance. So it has to be always in a relative terms. And I think which makes sense because you always have to think about what is the alternative opportunity for your money to be invested. And that alternative opportunity should be the market. And these days, if you look at Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway letter, then what he does is he always measure his book value increase against the S&P 500 index. That's what he does these days. But back then, when Warren Buffett formed his partnership, S&P 500 index didn't exist, and he measured his performance against the Dow. Third ground rule that he mentioned in the letter is his performance measurement time period. He said that the measurement performance period should be at least three years at the minimum because any measurement period below three years can be misleading because the stock market can go up and down without any rationale. So if you measure your performance within your one year time period, it can be completely due to luck. It's not driven by your investment acumen or knowledge or skill sets. That's one point that Warren Buffett pointed out in his ground rules saying that you have to measure your performance against the Dow at least within three years time period. If any three year or longer period produces poor results, then he encouraged 
his investors to look around for other places to have their money to be invested. So I think this also shows the characteristics and personality of Warren Buffett. He didn't really shy away from making such comments because that's not going to be good for his business. Who would make such statement to their clients? They're, he's basically saying to his clients and investors saying that if my performance is not good, just go find some other people who can invest your money better. So that's basically what he's saying here. And I think it's just surprising. And I think Warren Buffett has integrity and his honesty shines here in this letter. Fourth, he said that he's not in the business of predicting general market. This one has been the claim all along. And Warren Buffett, if you look at his investment letters or Berkshire Hathaway annual letters, from time to time, he makes some prediction in terms of market movement. But he's not in the business of predicting the market. He wanted to make sure that he can convey the opinions But he want to make sure that investors understand that he's not making investment decisions based on whether or not market is going to move up or down in the next two years or one year. But in the past, he regularly has mentioned that he has a strong faith in the U.S. market and U.S. market has been performing well over the last decades and centuries. And it's going to be the case in the future as well because America has the recipe for success and has the right political system, has right economic ecosystems for startup to be successful. All in all, America is a good place to invest your money. Fifth one that I want to bring out here in this episode is that he Warren Buffett cannot promise results to his partners, but what he can promise is as follows. Number one, <clears throat> his investment will be chosen on the basis of value, but not popularity. A lot of institutional investors usually follow other people's lead. For example, Bill Ackman invested a lot of money in Valiant and At the beginning, he made tons of money and he was able to produce a lot of returns. And other fund managers followed suit and invested their money in Valiant Pharmaceutical Company. And now what happened? Because of scandal that broke out in the company, the stock price went from 250 some, I think 30 something dollars to $15 right now. So It's going to be a huge mistake if you just follow other people or popular stocks without your strong rationale behind it. Second, he said that he's going to attempt to bring risk of permanent capital loss to an absolute minimum by a wide margin of safety. He's not going to invest in an overvalued stock. He's going to always look for opportunities to invest his money in undervalued securities and usually it's better if the margin of safety which represents the differences between intrinsic value of the business and actual market price that stock is selling at so if there's a huge gap that gives you a big margin of safety and that's going to minimize the risk of permanent capital loss so this is the concept the important crucial concept Warren Buffett learned from his teacher, mentor, Ben Graham, when he was attending University of California Business School. Third point he mentioned is that his entire net worth is going to be highly correlated with all the other investors' net worth in this partnership. Warren Buffett literally invested above 90% of his entire net worth in this partnership as he is right now for Berkshire Hathaway Corporation. So these are the five ground rules Warren Buffett laid out in this letter. I think that they all make sense and you should take a look and see what is why he made these kind of ground rules and why it is so important to communicate to investors about these ground rules because you are encouraging investors to be aligned with your objectives and strategies. And once you have the right set of investors on your side, you don't have to worry about misalignment between them. Okay, so that was about the ground rules. And why don't we move on to the next topic? 
In the previous episodes, I discussed how Warren Buffett used three different strategies for his first investment partnership. General issues, workouts, and control situations. I'm not going to go into the details in this episode for each strategy because I already discussed that in the previous episodes, but I want to go deep dive on workouts here and provide one great example of how Warren Buffett invested in these securities. So workouts represent an investment opportunities where a company is going through some sort of corporate events such as mergers, acquisitions, spin-offs, reorg, and etc. So the company that I want to introduce here is called Texas National Petroleum Company. And this is one of the few cases where Warren Buffett laid out his rationale why he purchased these securities. And before I go into the details about this company, I think it's important for me to explain how generally this merger arbitrage works. And this is, by the way, the strategy a lot of institutional investors are using right now. Here's a typical scenario of merger and acquisitions. So you have company A and company B. And company A announces its intention to buy company B at certain price. So let's say company B was selling at $25. And company A announced that it wants to buy company B at $40. Then what happens is that company B's stock price goes up from $25 to $38, but not all the way to $40. And you have this $2 spread. You can have $2 spread and $3 spread. It depends on the risk of the deal going through. What a risk arbitrager does is they are trying to make money based on this $2 spread. And if company A announces that it intends to buy the company B within six months, and you can calculate annual rise rate of return based on this $2 spread and the six month time period. There are two main risks involved in this merger arbitrage opportunities. The first main risk involved in the deal is that the deal may not go through in the future. So there are various reasons why the deal may not go through. For example, government agency may complain that the deal is going to violate antitrust law. Also, the shareholders can disapprove the deal either from acquiring side or acquired side. And if there is a dispute from shareholders, the deal may not go through. Third, acquiring company may have some financial problems and could have some potential problems to secure enough funding in order to proceed with the deal. Fourth, there could be some problems that company A discovered during its due diligence process, and this is similar to the situation where you're buying a house and you perform your house inspection, and if there's anything wrong, you don't really buy the house. It's basically the same thing. If company find something negative in company B, company A can drop the deal. So the problem is, if the deal does not go through, then the stock price is going to go down back to the original level, which is $25, or even lower. If this ever happens, because you got into this stock at $38, hoping to gain $2 spread, and you're loss is going to be very significant. So you have to be very careful about how you want to assess the probability of the deal falling through. The second main risk involved in the deal is the timing risk. Usually what happens is that acquiring company, when it announces its intention to buy company B, so there is a timetable attached to it, the deal may not go through according to the timetable. So timetable is, in this case, is very important because the $2 spread that you are trying to gain can give you very high rate of return if the time period of the deal is very short or it can be very low rate of return if the timetable attached to the deal is very long. 
Let me give you a quick example of how the timetable is going to affect your annualized rate of return. So if the deal is closed within 12 months, the $2 spread is going to give you 5% annualized return. But if deal closed within 3 months, then it's going to give you 21%. And if deal is closed within 1 month, it's going to give you 63% timetable it's gonna matter a lot and it's gonna determine your return quite significantly one another benefit that I want to mention here related to this merger and acquisition strategy is the fact that the strategy is not gonna affect it by general and overall market movement so usually the price and your return highly depend on the timetable the spread that you see and you have to assess the risk correctly but its price is not going to move up and down just like other stocks because of general market movement so what it means is that you're going to have a great return during bear markets but you're not going to have a good returns during bull markets in a relative terms so it all comes down to risk and return the question that you have to ask is how much spread you're going to get from this deal and how much risk do you have to take on in order to gain the spread? And as I mentioned, if the deal does not go through, then you're going to lose a lot of money. If you are really expert in this area, then I think you should go with the strategy. But if you don't know things about the industry, company, or the situation, then this is kind of risky strategy for an individual to pursue. I think that's enough about the background. So why don't we get into the actual case study. So the company that we are interested in here is called Texas National Petroleum Company. As you can see from the name of the company, this company produce oil and sell it. Before official announcement of acquisition, this company had some rumors around and people were saying that the company is going to be acquired in the near future. But as you know, Warren Buffett is not the type of person who's going to act on rumors. When official announcement came out, Warren Buffett looked at proxy statement and all the terms and conditions about the deal and invested his money. So let's determine what attracted him to this merger arbitrage situation. There were three different types of securities at that time. Bonds, common stock, and warrants. In fact, Warren Buffett invested in all three securities that the company had. The common stock, after the announcement, was selling at $6.7. So it's about 11% below the offer price. And the bonds was selling at approximately 98% point eight dollars so that is below face value one hundred dollars but the bonds were callable at one hundred four dollars and the lastly warrants the price was about three point one nine dollars so this is having this similar discount to the common stock so if you look if you take into account the time period then what is going to be the annualized rate of return for these securities so for bonds, it was approximately 18% annualized rate of return if you take into account capitalized gain and also coupon. And if you look at common equity and warrants, then the annualized rate of rate in six months was approximately 22%. So fairly all these three securities represented very attractive return for Warren Buffett it can be only attractive when you compare against the risks involved in this deal. So in the first part of this episode, we discussed different types of risks involved in merger arbitrage situation. In the letter, Warren Buffett laid out three different types of risk involved in this specific deal and why he thinks that the risks are very small relative to gain that he's going to get. First type of risk that he mentioned is shareholder disapproval risk. And he thinks that it's almost zero because management has 40% shares of entire company. And management team is the one who negotiated the deal with acquiring company. 
So they got the good price, and there's no reason why they they're gonna disapprove after the negotiation, because they're the one who did the negotiation. Second, legal approvals or antitrust law, and he didn't really go into the details about why this risk is small. But if you look at historical context, during that time there were a lot of M and A deals in the oil industry. When I did some research, I found out that a lot of smaller oil exploration companies were consolidated by the larger ones. So, for example, Union Oil of California acquiring company acquired Uli Petroleum in 1959, and also was in the process of merging with another company called Pure Oil Company. So there were a lot of acquisitions and mergers happening during that time. So my guess is that Warren Buffett assessed the legal risks very small, and he said almost none. The last major hurdle was a tax ruling was necessary related to the University of Southern California, and this is the university that had nonprofit status. And the holder of some production payments at that time from this acquired company, Warren Buffett mentioned in his letter, this could function as additional hurdle that might delay the process. But he also mentioned that it's not gonna be showstopper to the final deal going through. So as you can see, Warren Buffett looked at different types of risk when it comes to. Purchasing shares of a acquired company, but I think that he didn't really lay out all the details. But I'm sure that he had the experience of merger arbitrage situations, and the potential rewards were quite clear. Then he was able to compare the potential rewards and the risks involved. And it's quite important for you to understand what it takes to be successful in this merger arbitrage situation. And you have to tread very carefully. In this case, Warren Buffett ended up, as I mentioned, investing in all three classes of securities. He amassed bonds with a total face value of two hundred sixty thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars, and sixty thousand shares of common stocks, and eighty-three thousand warrants to purchase common stocks. While the deal ended up taking a bit longer than expected, the overall payoff was slightly higher than originally calculated, about seven point five nine dollars per share rather than seven point four two dollars that was stated in the original proxy statement. In light of this, Warren Buffett commented, "This illustrates, quote unquote, usual pattern. First." The deals take longer than originally projected, and second, the payouts tend to average a bit better than estimates. With TNP, which is acquired company, it took a couple of extra months, and we received a couple of extra points. So overall, annualized return for Warren Buffett was approximately twenty percent for bonds and twenty-two percent for stocks. And warrants. Let me try to summarize this deal. So this one was a case of special situation investment, specifically a merger arbitrage opportunity. The spread was very attractive, very high single digit for the bonds, and approximately ten percent for the equities. However, if you look at an annualized basis, investor would have expected approximately. A twenty percent return on the investment, but what I mentioned repeatedly, and what you need to focus on, is the risks involved in this deal. Because as I mentioned, if the deal doesn't go through, then you're gonna have significant loss. But as Warren Buffett assessed the risks, the risks of this deal falling through were very small, and given the attractive return, it was worth taking the risk. Okay, that's it for this episode. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my channel wherever you listen to this podcast. 
In the subsequent episodes, I'll continue to talk about Warren Buffett and there will be a lot of interesting topics. So I'm so excited and see you next time.